Tonight we're going to study 1 Peter chapter 4. And as we've been talking about for a general theme, um, Peter has his eyes on heaven very much. His, um, his idea is that we need to be people who live and move upon this earth but with a real mentality and hope towards heaven. And so we're going to see this again because it's sprinkled throughout this letter of First Peter. But, but, but this j- chapter in general has its idea of how we should serve a- and the attitude with which we should suffer in these very last days. You'll see what I mean. Look at verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh... By the way, at the end of chapter 3, he's speaking about Jesus' suffering being an example for us and what we can learn from the suffering of Jesus on our behalf. So let's come back to this. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men but for the will of God. What Peter does in the first two verses of 1 Peter chapter 4 is he calls you and I, his readers, every believer who will pay attention, he calls us to equip ourselves with a certain determination, a certain attitude in the battle against sin and for holiness. The basic idea is this, is that the commitment God calls us to have is patterned after the commitment that Jesus had in enduring all that he endured in and through his sufferings on the cross. We need to have a commitment to God that will endure in these last days. Notice the phrase from verse 1, arm yourself with the same mind. Isn't that sort of an interesting phrase? We usually think of something like, arm yourself with a big handgun. Arm yourself with an assault rifle. No, no, no. There's a kind of arming yourself that's even more important than a physical weapon you can put in your hand because you could give somebody the best weapons in the world, but if they don't have the right mentality to use them wisely and accurately, what good is it? He's saying arm yourself with a certain kind of mentality, an attitude that says, I'm going to be willing to sacrifice for the sake of following Jesus Christ. Sometimes in the Christian life, We only want victory if it'll come easy. Okay, God, I'll take all those easy victories. The the stuff that just kind of rolls my way, give those to me. The things I'm going to really have to press forward and reach out for and and strive to attain in my Christian life, no, I'm not interested in those. Peter says, get rid of that attitude. Have the attitude that you're going to arm yourself with the same mind that sent Jesus to the cross to make his sacrifice. You know, Jesus spoke about the kind of mentality we need to have in the battle against sin. He said some things that some people wish he wouldn't have said, and I understand why they wish he wouldn't have said them. Jesus said things on occasions like this, that if your hand offends you, cut it off. It's better to enter into heaven without a hand than to go to hell with a whole body. Now, now some people have taken that metaphor and twisted it and used it actually to to maim or to mutilate themselves. That wasn't Jesus' idea. But he spoke to a mentality that very much Peter speaks to here. This is is sort of like the football coach talking to the team in the locker room at halftime. you got to go out there and you got to fight. The the, the Christian life is not going to be always easy. There are times when it's going to be a struggle. Now, I know there's something within me, it's probably in many of you as well, that I just kind of long for this day when everything's going to be easy in my Christian life, where trials, where temptations, where the struggles of the flesh, those will be like bullets bouncing off the chest of Superman. I'm waiting for that day. And you know what? It's going to come. We call it heaven. Until that day, God wants me arm myself with the mentality that says, I'm not going to give up just because it's a fight. Notice what else he says here in verse 1. It's remarkable. He says, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. When a person suffers physical persecution for the sake of Jesus, it almost always profoundly changes their outlook regarding sin and the pursuit of the lust of the flesh. 
Now, Peter isn't giving some kind of spiritual law that if you suffer persecution, you're never going to sin again. But he is illustrating something that when you pay a sacrifice in the, in the battle against sin, especially in the terms of persecution, it changes something in you. You realize what's really important in this world, and it's the spiritual things that are more important than the material of things. You're going to be one of those people, notice verse 2, that learn how to not live the rest of his time in the lust of the flesh, but for the will of God. And look at this phrasing in verse 3, starting in verse 3. It's beautiful. What a a word for our age, for our present day, starting here at verse 3. Take a look at this. He says, For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation. Speaking evil of you, they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Well, there's a lot to unpack in these four verses. Let's start back at verse 3. I love the phrasing that Peter uses. After talking about the mentality that we're supposed to have as servants of Jesus Christ, where we're willing to embrace some suffering along the way to follow after Jesus, he says this, verse 3, for we've spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. It's as if Peter says, isn't it enough? Honestly now. You you, you spent your time living like the world. Haven't you had your fill? How many times are you going to be like a dog returning to its vomit? How many times are you going to go back to those same things again and again? Sadly, many Christians in their heart of hearts, they think that I have not spent enough time in those things. I need to go back and spend more time in those things. Many Christians, and may I speak especially to you younger believers who have been raised in believing homes. You think, listen, I'll give that full-on commitment to Jesus Christ. I know in my heart and in my soul that that's the only way to live, but let me just spend my time having fun. That's what you'll say to yourself first. I'll come back to it in the day. And Peter looks at you and he looks at me and he goes, haven't you spent enough time in those things? Isn't enough enough? And then I love the list that he goes into, starting with in verse um, uh, 3, where he says, doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in licentiousness, or I like the translation here in the New King James, lewdness. This word begins a list of sins that Peter understood should only mark the past life of the Christian. Do you see the list that's in verse 3? That should mark the past life of the Christian, not the present life, and certainly not the future life of the believer. And he begins with an interesting word. It's the word translated in the New King James Version, lewdness. The the ESV and the New American Standard have sensuality. And the NIV has a word, uh, it's a great word. I, I wish we used it more in our culture because we sure have enough of it in our culture. I wish we used it, debauchery. Then the idea of simply this, well, no matter what English word you use to translate, the idea of the basic Greek word is this. It's someone who lives without restraint. It's someone whose appetites are indulged beyond any decent measure. Look, isn't it enough? But no, it's not enough. I need more, more, more. And when you look at this list, lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties. Stop right there. Lewdness, lusts drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties. Peter wrote this 2,000 years ago. We've come a long way in 2,000 years, haven't we? Hasn't humanity advanced marvelously? Because humanity has advanced so wonderfully in 2,000 years that this list is completely irrelevant to us in the present age. Isn't it remarkable? (laughs) This is just, when you you realize this, what, what? What corruption there is in humanity. Oh, how we need Jesus. How we really need Jesus. The same thing that Peter had to tell believers to stay away from 2,000 years ago that should mark your past life, the life of the world. Those are the same things we need to hear today. Notice this, though, verse 4. He speaks of unbelievers 
who in, in shorthand, Peter refers to them as Gentiles, he says of unbelievers, verse 4, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation. When the world looks at our godly living, they think it's strange that we don't follow after them. You, you, you mean you don't? Why? Now, in the ancient world, it was more blatant than in our present age. It's certainly present in our present age. But in the ancient world, it was even more blatant. In the ancient world, many entertainments took place at pagan temples that also had like meeting rooms uh, and restaurants. And um, I was thinking of, the, of a less polite, houses of prostitution all together. Meeting room, community center, restaurant, house of prostitution all together. And when people would go there, they would go and usually partake of everything that was there. A little bit of idolatry, a little bit of prostitution, have a good meal, and you get together with all your buddies. And so the idea is this. You, you, don't, you don't want to come over with us to the temple of Jupiter after work? What are you, do you, what, what are you some square? Do you hate us? What's wrong? We go, well, you guys, and all you do is get drunk and go around with the prostitutes and then everybody's sacrificing to idols. You know, that's not me. I'm a Christian. Oh, you're a, some weirdo, aren't you? Now, now listen, that dynamic is present in our modern age. It's just not as blatant. In the first century, it was very blatant. But ladies and gentlemen, th there are places where we just need to say, Listen, I, I'm not trying to condemn you. Certainly, I'm not trying to act holier than thou. But, but the, the, the reason why I can't go with you has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with me. I'm trying to live a life where those things are in the past, not in the present. So let's go to Starbucks or let's go to a coffee place instead and, and leave those other things aside. But they'll think strange of it. And verse 4 says that at times they will speak evil of you because of it. They'll speak evil of you. Wow, look at them. Look at, oh, she's so high and mighty, she doesn't want to be a part of the things we're a part of. Well, what? You, and they'll say things like that. That's part of what we need to endure as believers. But notice verse 5 they will give an account to him who is ready to judge. Those who denigrate Christians for. Um, restraining themselves from sin, they will have to answer for that before God. Now, verse 6 is weird. Can I say that as a Bible teacher? That there are some verses in the Bible that are just like, whoa, that's weird. In the midst of this talking about judgment to come, Peter sort of drops a little bomb here at verse 6 where he says, for this reason the gospel was preached also to those who are dead. What? When was the gospel preached to those who are dead? You see, Peter says that because of this eternal judgment, the gospel is preached to the dead. The righteous dead know and they live on in constant awareness of the reality of eternity. They know. You don't have to convince anybody who's passed from this life to the world beyond that eternity is real. You and I may maybe have the luxury of thinking, well, is it real or is it not? They don't have that luxury. They're living in it. So that's one idea, but th th there's two basic different ideas on what Peter meant by the words preached also to those who are dead. Who are these dead people that Jesus preached to? Well, I'll give you two ideas. You could pick either one. Here's number one. The first idea is that these are the faithful ones who died before Jesus' work on the cross. Jesus told a story in Luke chapter 16, and I go against many Bible teachers in my own peculiar understanding of this. I don't think this was a parable. I think this was a story that Jesus told about a rich man who died and a poor man who died, and the rich man was very wicked, and the poor man was righteous. And they both went to Hades, the realm of the dead. Now again, this is before the finished work of Jesus on the cross. They both went to Hades, the realm of the dead. But there was a terrible place in Hades, region if you want to call it in Hades, a place of torment. But there was also a pleasant 
place in Hades, the Rome of the dead, called Abraham's bosom. It was where he got to hang out with Abraham and all the great men of old. Well, it may very well be that when Jesus preached to those who are dead, it speaks about not giving these people a second chance, but just simply Jesus announcing to the faithful dead who died in faith that the work of the Messiah to come, he came and said, I did it. Here's the good news. Now you can come to heaven with me. That's a very good supposition of whom the dead were that Jesus preached to. But there is another idea. The second idea is that these ones to whom Jesus preached to were those in the Christian community who had already died, perhaps even dying as martyrs. It may be that Peter is causing these early believers to remember, do you remember those faithful people among us who already did? Jesus had already preached to them, and they believed it, and they made it through a season of suffering. They stood for their faith, and so can you. So, uh, I don't know, it could go either way, these dead ones that Jesus preached to, those who died as martyrs or those who died in faith before the finished work of Jesus, but that's the idea there, ending in verse 6. Now, in verse 7, But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. I want you to notice verse 7. I was so struck by verse 7 in my preparation for tonight. The end of all things is at hand. When we say that, do you picture a guy walking with a sign, the end is near, you know, walking down the street, you know, that kind of thing. This is what Peter's saying. He's going, listen, this... This whole thing that we have right here in this world, it's got an expiration date on it. Just like that bottle of milk in your refrigerator that's about two weeks sour. It's got an expiration date on it. So does this world. We don't know what the date is, but God certainly knows. And just like that bottle of milk in your refrigerator, it is certainly going to spoil one day and needs to be gotten rid of. God knows when the right day is to change out the bottle, so to speak, in his refrigerator. The end of all things that is at hand. Jesus Christ is coming again. We need to be ready and aware for his coming. Okay, you got that in your mind? Solidly in your mind there? Now notice the next part of verse 7. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. If you are really into the return of Jesus Christ, it should make you a man or a woman of prayer. And look, I I know, I know you might know the mysteries of biblical prophecy down to the the most minute little edge. And I'm not depreciating it. I find biblical prophecy fascinating. Listen, if it doesn't result in a deeper and more passionate prayer life, what is really your understanding of, of the end times? This is what it should result in. But that's not all it should result in. Look at verses 8 through 11. Peter also writes this, and above all things have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. It's as if Peter says this. Okay, listen. This part about prayer is very important. If you believe Jesus is coming again, if you believe that the time is short, if you believe that the prophetic clock is ticking and the scenario is ready, if you cry out, Maranatha, the Lord cometh, which I think we should all be ready and waiting and anticipated and interested in the return of Jesus. But first, does it make you a person of prayer? And number two, does it make you a person of love? Look at it again right there in verse 8. Above all things have fervent love for one another. Ladies and gentlemen, if these are the last days, and I believe they are, it's more important than ever that we love those with whom we're going to share eternity with. We need to make every effort to get along with each other. Because you know what? We're going to heaven together, and we're going to be there for eternity. We may as well practice getting together, getting, getting on, you know, well with each other right now. If you believe it's soon, then you better make up things now with other people. In light of eternity, we must have a fervent love for one another. Why? Look at the other part of verse 8. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Ladies and gentlemen, i got to say, verse 8, I find it to be very challenging. 
because sometimes love will expose sin. Sometimes love will say, you've gone on in this lie long enough. If you don't tell them, I'll tell them. Oh, I've had to have that kind of conversation with a wayward husband more than once in my ministry. If you don't tell her, I'm going to tell her you've lived in the darkness long enough. There are times where love, and I didn't do it out of anger. I, I didn't do it out of, you know, hatred. There are times I know when love will expose sin. But, but I think that is more the rarity. The normal operating code of love is to cover over a multitude of sins. Again, I'm not trying to say always, and there's certainly times when the Holy Spirit would have us lead out of love and, and, and expose sin. Does, does everybody understand that? But so often what Peter says is true. Love covers over sins. You want to talk about my sins? That's a long conversation, isn't it? We could sit down and talk a long time. But how do we do it in the Christian world? We have a generous overlooking of each other's sins and faults. Now, occasionally there's somebody, and I suppose if this person really is anointed and empowered by the Spirit of God, it's a glorious thing. Otherwise, they're, they're almost from the pit. But every once in a while, there's a person who feels like it's their Christian duty to challenge everybody on every fault and flaw that they have. Oh, that, that's just not common operating procedure in the body of Christ. Love covers a multitude of sins. Now, again, I, I, I hope you appreciate I'm such of two minds of this. I can see this verse being abused so easily. I can see an abusive husband pressuring his wife to not report what she should report to the police based on a principle like this. I can envision in my mind um, a, a, a drug addict who gets caught in the act and really needs to be brought up to face the consequences of their actions, but, but does everything and persuades other people to hide it over and to enable them and to cover them but, but because we'll base trying to appeal to this principle. So you see, I'm conflicted because there are times when sin needs to be exposed. But I guess the way to put it is, let me read you a wonderful quote from a Bible commentator, Wayne Grudem. He says this, where love abounds in a fellowship of Christians, many small offenses and even some large ones are readily overlooked and forgotten. Now check this, but where love is lacking, every word is viewed with suspicion. Every action is liable to misunderstanding and conflicts abound to Satan's perverse delight. And you know, if you've ever been in that kind of environment, P-U, does that stink? But when you have the environment where love covers a multitude of sins, it's just a beautiful thing among God's people. Now again, more on how we should be as last day believers. Look at verse 9. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. Or if anyone ministers, let him do it as the, with the ability that God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. There's so much in here. First of all, look at verse 9. He says, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Why does Peter have to warn the hospitable against grumbling? Because when you're hospitable to people, they're going to give you an occasion for grumbling. They will. I mean, it just happens that way. So, hey, be hospitable. Just watch that you don't do it with a lot of grumbling. Keep that down. Secondly, 
Every believer should be using their gifts. Look at verse 10. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. Love will show itself as we give to the church family what God has put within us as gifts. And as we do, we're good stewards of the manifold grace of God, the many-sided grace that God has given to us. I think it's a wonderful thing. First of all, the thought that every believer should be looking to use their gift in some way that benefits God's people. Lord, what is my gift? How can it be used to be a benefit to other people? God has gifted you in some ways. How can you use that to be a benefit to others? You might be thinking, no, David, you're talking about other people. I'm the one person who has no gift whatsoever. Well, you know what? Listen. I would even speak to you, my giftless brother or sister. You are a believer, are you not? You can pray, can you not? Well, maybe your gift is as simple as prayer and intercession. That can be a genuine gift in a way that you serve God's people in a wonderful and powerful way. But maybe your gifts go much further than that, much broader than that. Well, that's a wonderful thing too. But what a powerful, what a dynamic thing it is when God's people are truly using their gifts together, when the church is less spectator and more player in the game. That's what we're looking for in the operation of God's body. Now, it's also interesting that Paul, excuse me, that Peter, I said Paul because I'm going to talk about Paul in just a minute. I haven't said Paul for Peter yet tonight, have I? Okay, good. Notice this, that he connects using your gifts to being a good steward of the manifold grace of God. Let's break that down. A good steward. Do we know what a steward is? A steward is a manager of something. A a money manager, somebody who handles a pension fund. They are a steward of that pension fund. Um, Whatever it is that you manage, that you take care of, you're a steward over that. Okay? You're a steward of the manifold grace of God. What does he mean by manifold? Um, It has many sides. It's just wonderful and beautiful. It's like a kaleidoscope of grace. It has so many different facets and beautiful things. A beautiful diamond has many facets to it. Okay, you're a steward of the manifold grace of God. God has given you his grace so that you would be a steward of it. In other words, grace does not flow into us just like a one-way street. Give me grace, give me grace, give me grace, God. Which is good. Ask God for his grace. You and I, we all need more of it. But God gives us grace so that we can be stewards of it. This is very similar to something that the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15.10. Paul made it very clear that he was saved by God's grace. But at the same time, he says this. His grace was not in vain towards me because Paul worked very hard. There is a sense in which, I pause just a little bit because some people from theological backgrounds would would disagree very vehemently with what I'm going to say. But what Peter's talking about, what Paul speaks about in 1 Corinthians 15, there is a sense in which God's grace is wasted upon people. Some people receive God's grace and don't do anything with it. They are not a good steward of the manifold grace of God. And God's work isn't furthered as it could be. So therefore, what are you supposed to do? Verse 11, if anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability that God supplies. And then I love how Peter goes on at the end of verse 11, which he says, that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Here, he's very, being very much like the apostle Paul in some of his letters, where he just gets all wound up. And pretty soon he's just praising God. And has to take, okay, wait a minute. I got more to write here. He just got all excited and started doing his doxology already there at verse 11. Now at verse 12. Back now to addressing suffering Christians, he says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings 
that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. There is a fiery trial which is to try you. Don't think it's strange. Friends, it's a big deal here. It's a very important idea in the Christian life that some people come to Jesus Christ and they put their faith in him as Savior and Lord with a wrong conception. And the conception goes something like this. Jesus Christ is going to make my life easy and pleasant and comfortable. If you have that mentality, when a fiery trial comes into your life, you're going to think it's the strangest thing that ever happened. Whoa, hey, I didn't sign up for this. I, I put my trust in Jesus to get me out of stuff like this. Not, not, not that I would experience stuff like this. What's going on around here? Peter's saying, do not think it's strange about the fiery trial that has come upon you. But by the way, before I get into verse 13, I got to say one more thing about verse 12. Do you remember a time when Peter thought it was strange about a fiery trial? When Jesus told his disciples, he said, listen, guys, um, the son of man, he's got to go and be rejected of the Gentiles. I'm going to be delivered to them, rejected by the religious leaders. I'm going to be delivered to the Gentiles. I'm going to be crucified. And what Peter thought that was the strangest thing he ever heard. No, don't you do that, Jesus. That's completely wrong. There was a time when Peter himself thought that such suffering was strange. Now he's grown. Now he's matured in his understanding. Instead, he says, he says, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. Friends, I want you to look at those words very carefully. You partake of Christ's sufferings. Do you understand what that means? What, what does it mean to partake? I'm going to partake of some water right now. I shared the water that was in this bottle and I shared it inside my own mouth and swallowed it. That's partaking of the water. There is a sense in which we as believers, we share in the sufferings of Jesus Christ. That's a profound statement. All right, stay with me on this. Were the sufferings of Jesus full of meaning? Were they full of significance? Yes, they were. I'll fight you on that all day long if you want to try to tell me that the sufferings of Jesus were meaningless, that they had no significance. We can argue about that after my teaching. But I'm going to tell you, the sufferings of Jesus were deeply meaningful, full of significance. Now catch this. If your sufferings can be connected to his, your sufferings are meaningful and full of significance. Look, let's get right down to it. What fills us with despair usually is not just the sense that we're suffering. Come on, we're not babies that bad. We're, we're, oh, you know, I mean, we, we kind of gave it up where we, where we cry like babies when we get a shot at the doctor's office. Why? Okay, I know I need it. It's important. Go ahead. Boom. Okay, I get it. It hurts, but I didn't like it, but I knew it had meaning. I knew it was significant. Now, here's the point. If all your sufferings can be attached to what Jesus did and share in some of its meaning and significance, there's no suffering that's wasted in your life. Friends, it's meaningless suffering that drives us to despair. It's, it's insignificant things that got, why, why, why? But if we knew there's something meaningful, something important in it, we would steel ourselves up with a new sense of strength and resolve, and we would say, Lord, you giving me strength, we're going to work through this, God. And therefore, verse 13, you can rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. The closer you've been to Jesus in this life, including what Paul called the fellowship of his sufferings, the more you're going to rejoice when Jesus Christ is finally revealed. 
We should never deny the place of suffering in building godliness in the Christian life. There's enough needless pain that we put upon ourselves. But the things that we endure in the plan of God and unto the glory of God, they are absolutely transforming by His Spirit and build in us hearts that are closer to Jesus than ever. Don't waste your sorrows. Don't waste your suffering. Why are you going to let it go to waste? This could be a powerful tool to draw you closer to your Savior than ever. So don't waste it. Let it do its good and perfect work. Now, starting at verse 14, there's a big difference between suffering as a Christian and suffering as an evildoer. Notice verse 14. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he's blasphemed, but on your part, he's glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. I love how Peter writes, so practical. He's been talking to us about the glory and the significance of suffering, how our suffering can be attached to Jesus' suffering and therefore gain meaning and significance that that extends even into the next world. But, but then in verse 30, well, listen, I didn't mean every suffering, Peter says. You know that stuff you suffer because you were evil? Yeah, that, that probably doesn't count so much. I mean, look at the way he describes this. He says, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, that's glorious. But let none of you, verse 15, suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody. By the way, did you notice that list? Can I just read that to you again? Here we go. Ready? Murderer, thief, evildoer, busybody. Wow. Wow. What is a busybody? I suppose one way to define a busybody, I guess I should have looked this up in the Greek, busybodios or something like that. (laughs) One way to understand the idea of busybody, it's someone who takes more entertainment value in the lives of other people than in their own life. In other words, you talk, you live, you, you give your opinions about, you give your judgments about the lives of other people instead of being focused on living your own life. You're busy about other people's business instead of paying attention to your own. And I just think it's a fascinating thing that when Peter's listing like this rogues gallery of sinners... Murderers and busybodies, thieves and busybodies, evildoers and busybodies. It's a heavy thing. These busybodies in other people's matters suffer a lot of grief and pain, but not for the sake of Jesus. So if you came to Peter and said, Peter, I'm suffering so much. All my friends don't like me because I'm such a busybody in their matters. Peter's like, yeah, well, don't pin that one on Jesus. That's for your own sake. Continuing on, though, he says, but, verse 16, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. It is so difficult for us to comprehend in the Western world, though we're moving in this direction about the shame that is heaped upon Christians in many parts of the world. If you are a Christian, you are made to feel as if you are the most worthless piece of garbage that ever laid in a gutter. It is thought to be such a shameful, degraded thing to be a follower of Jesus in many parts of the world where Christians are persecuted. And Peter wants everybody to know you got nothing to be ashamed about. Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. 
You, you really are on the winning side. If anyone suffers as a Christian. Now, by the way, I find it fascinating here that he uses the term Christian. Did you know that the word Christian is only used three times in the New Testament? Are you aware of that? It's kind of fascinating what the word means. It's a Greek word here, of course, but it comes from a Latin formulation. Sometimes people wrongly say, and I've probably wrongly said this at times, that Christian means like little Jesus, little Christ. That's really not the idea. It's more the of the party of Jesus. I'm associated with Jesus. I'm with him. I'm of his group. Count me with him. And so Peter's saying, if anybody, if you suffer because you are a Christian, you're associated with Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian. And he goes, you, you don't need to be ashamed for that. You know, the original followers of Jesus were called disciples. They were called believers. They were called those people who belonged to the way. All of those were titles for followers of Jesus before they ever received the title Christian. The, the word Christian sort of came as a nickname, sort of a degrading one. Okay, n n nobody... This just came into my head, so I'll probably regret saying it later. But I'm just giving you examples. Does everybody understand what I'm going to say right now is just an example. It would be like mocking somebody by calling them Hitlerian. You're, you're of the Hitlers. You know, that kind of thing. It would be a way to just that kind of thing. Now, of course, it has that, that, that's more the idea of evil rather than shameful but they would do it to mock Christians. Oh, you're those Jesus people. Something like in the 1970s when followers of Jesus were called Jesus freaks. It, it would be very much like that same idea. Now, where was that first coined? In the city of Antioch. Acts chapter 11, verse 26 tells us that the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now, it's interesting. That was about A.D. 43. 20 years later, excuse me, no, about 16 years later, Agrippa, a Roman ruler, told Paul, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. 16 years later, that word for the follower of Jesus is on the lips of a Roman ruler. It went just from being, you know, a mocking term used on the streets of Antioch to being a broadly used term in the Roman Empire. And then just a few years after that, AD 63, about four years later, that's when Peter wrote this, calling the followers of Jesus Christians. But now let, let's finish up with the last three verses of the chapter. He says, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will the end be of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now... If the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Okay, let's remember our whole context here. Christians, you're suffering. Be courageous in your suffering. Don't give up in your suffering. Isn't this the whole context right here? Then Peter drops another bomb on us in verse 17. He says, what? For judgment begins at the house of God. God may allow suffering among believers to purify them. No, I don't want to be purified by that. Can't you just teach me a Bible study and purify me that way? Well, sometimes if we would listen to Bible studies more, there might be less, you know, purification that happens to have to happen other ways. But sometimes God will allow suffering to be a purifying agent in the lives of his people. You didn't pray much. Now you're praying. You didn't cry out to God and trust him much. Now you sure are. You didn't have a passionate desperate trust in Jesus before. You sure do now. Isn't that some of the purifying that God does in and through suffering among his people? Now, notice this. 
Now is our time of fiery trial. The ungodly will have their fire later. The fire we endure now purifies us. The fire the ungodly will endure later will punish them. This is what you need to understand. Though there may be purification in sufferings that God allows, there's never punishment. Please follow with this, me on, folks. If you miss this, you've missed something big. How much of the punishment of your sin was placed upon Jesus on the cross? Uh, 80%? 85%? 95%? 99 of our sin, guilt, and shame was borne by Jesus on the cross. So God does not use suffering to punish us, but he may use it at times to purify us. All the punishment we deserved was laid upon Jesus at the cross. But friends, the same fire that consumes straw will purify gold. The fire's the same, But the purpose in its application is different and its effect is different. Even so, sometimes Christians suffer the same things that the ungodly do. Yet the purpose of God is different and the effect is different. You guys uh, ever hear of uh, Dr. Um, uh, J. Vernon McGee through the Bible radio? One time, Ingalil and I had the privilege to sit down and have lunch with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. It's a long story, but he used to come up to Ventura to get his hearing aids adjusted, and the gal who worked in the hearing aid office uh, was a friend of ours, and so they just, we went out to lunch. We went out, we, I went out to lunch with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. <laughs> and he and his wife were there, and so obviously what you do at something like that is you just try to get Dr. J. Vernon McGee talking about stories. And so we would just throw out, it was, it's just a, it's so memorable to me. He shared about the time when his wife had given birth to a child and the child didn't make it out of the hospital. And he shared how across the hall in the hospital wing, he could hear some people with profane language and lots of boos celebrating the birth of their little baby. And he said, God, why? Why does this happen? Listen, there are many answers to the why question. Many. And, and, and not all of them satisfy us on this side of eternity. But please understand this. Even though God may allow the same tragic event to happen to a believer as to an unbeliever, the purpose and the effect can be completely different. It can burn up one and it can purify the other. This is what God can do in the greatness of his work. Then he says, verse 18, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, then what about us? Where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, verse 19, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Isn't that the summary of everything, verse 19? Friends, whatever suffering that God calls us to endure, let's commit our souls to God in the midst of it. Let's just decide right now. Let's commit our souls to God now in the midst of it. By the way, that ancient Greek word that's translated commit is a technical one. It's used for leaving money on deposit with a trusted friend. Commit your soul to God like that and commit it to him before the battle. So often in the midst of the battle, in the midst of the suffering, okay, Lord, now I commit my soul to you. God said, no, you commit it to me now. And I'll hold your soul safe in the day of grievous trial. Because it'll come. But God helping us, we will be faithful. And not a single bit of our suffering will be wasted. But because we are partakers of the sufferings of Christ He will transform it into something full of meaning and significance to his glory. 
Father in heaven, this is our prayer. Lord, this, this, is, uh, this is basic, but it is ever so important teaching about the role of suffering in the life of the believer. Lord, all, all I can do now is pray for those in our midst here this evening who endure some special sort of suffering right now. Lord, maybe their suffering is evident to other people. Maybe it is completely secret within their own soul. But God, I ask that you would bring your grace, your love, your deliverance, your goodness. Bring it to the hurting soul. And do it, Father. Do it by the power and the love and the grace of Jesus. Lord, we don't want our sorrows and our sufferings to be wasted at all, but to be a full and good effect before you. Help us with it, Lord. We praise you and give you honor in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.